The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. Mike, we're back. Another episode of The Unlikely Innovators. Mike, have you ever been scared of what goes bump in the night? Uh, all the time, actually. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm, I was always scared of the dark when I was a kid. But uh, today we have Emily Zark on, and she'll sort of start to explain some of those monsters that we might be fearing. Uh, Emily is, of course, uh, a professor in the Arizona State University uh, Department of Literature, and she specializes in monsters. What a, what a great time to have her on. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, the perfect season for this because I think we've got uh, monsters, goblins, and, and ghouls on the brain. Uh, but I think what Emily did in this episode was I think really kind of tie in how you know monster history is human history. And I think from that lens, you know, we could see how these stories that we tell ourselves and these char- these creatures that we often sometimes make up I think tie back to the experiences we've had in our lives and, you know, in, in our communities. I really liked how she sort of linked it academically and socially for us. But then of course we still had to have fun and we had to ask her specific questions about the monsters that we all know and love and what her favorite monsters are. So I think uh, we'll leave it there for now, but we'll now introduce Emily Zarka to our audience. Here's Emily. We're joined by Emily Zarka. Emily Zarka earned her doctorate in literature from Arizona State University, where she currently serves as a faculty member in the English department. Uh, She's the creator, writer, and host of the popular award-winning YouTube series called Monstrum, which is on PBS's Storied channel. Uh, She serves as co-host and script editor for Storied's Fate and Fabled series, and has also wrote and hosted the Telly award-winning PBS documentary uh, special called Exhumed, A History of Zombies, which is a very near and dear place in my heart because my wife and I love zombies. And now we're really happy to be joined by uh, Emily Zarka. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So Emily, um, we often, uh, and I mentioned off air, I'm just so pleased that you have so many books around you because uh, <laughs> it, I think it really is uh, appropriate because uh, uh, you seem to have been obsessed with myth- mythology for some time. And I think what we'd kind of like to do is ask a question at the beginning that sort of elucidates to us and the listeners, you know, where did this, where did this specialty and, 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 and path come from? So were you drawn to mythology at an early age or did you ever think you'd study this, you know, ever at the doctoral level and <laughs> my gosh, ever make a career out of it? Well, it's definitely a two-part question for me, um, but the short answer is that I have always been fascinated by horror and spooky stories. I was fortunate enough to have a mom who introduced me to some horror classics at a very young age, so I had that side going in one of my interests. And then, yes, as a kid, I was obsessed with mythology, particularly Egyptian mythology. I wanted to be an Egyptologist at one point in my life, but I never thought that either of those career paths were really going to be something that I could pursue. I originally started going to college for my undergraduate work to be a journalist, Um, but I was so obsessed with reading just in any capacity that I was taking a bunch of literature courses. And my advisor was like, why don't you just pick up a second degree? And I was lucky enough to have some amazing professors at the University of Colorado who showed me that both horror and Gothic literature aligned with a lot of my interests in a scholarly way that I hadn't been able to see before. So I doubled down on both of those things and started my PhD researching the undead in British romantic history. And that forced me to go further and further back into historical folklore and mythology and I emerged with my PhD and called myself a monster expert long before I'm sure I deserved the title, but I think I've earned it now. And I'm just very fortunate to have a career that I really do love. Well, I was going to say, I, I am still also admiring your your bookshelf behind you. I'm at the point in, in my marriage where my wife has, has asked me to donate the books that no longer fit on the shelf and have been into overflow, but... I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep them. So I'm thinking about other ways that I could build more shelving to try to have everything on display and out of the Yes, the spillover you can't areas. get rid of them. I call them my book children. I've had some <laughs> of these books since I was in middle school um, and I always cart them around with me wherever I live. So I'm very fortunate to have a large enough library to house all of them, but there are ways we can talk. There are ways you can find to use your books, Mike. Don't get rid of them. I, I will definitely follow up for sure. 
But, um, you know, you kind of touched on this, how you were initially looking to get into journalism. So maybe this question kind of will kind of tie back to that. But obviously, you know, as we know, most PhDs don't end up hosting their own shows or being a part of documentaries. Um, so in terms of getting into that line of work, how did that transition happen? And, and was it unexpected to you or because you were always kind of interested in journalism? Was it kind of something you thought you might get into at some point? I think that the world works in mysterious ways. Um, so yeah, I guess my journalism training did help me in the long run, but ultimately this whole journey has been a complete surprise and joy from the beginning. Uh, I owe a lot of where I am now to where I received my PhD and where I teach now at ASU. I had some amazing mentors there. And in part of my program process, I was chosen for something called knowledge mobilization, where I actually had to think about my research in a more public facing way. And as I was doing that, I became more passionate about it. And a lot of my work right now as a monster expert with PBS and beyond is about trying to make education accessible to everyone, um, not just behind a tuition paywall or you know behind the ivory tower of academia. And I do do some of that kind of traditional teaching, but Monstrum and Exhumed and Fate and Fabled give me a chance to reach even more students. So I like to say that I have students across the world. And again, that's been a really surprising journey. Um, PBS is kind of a stroke of luck, to be quite honest. Of course, I grew up with PBS. Fun fact, I was actually named after the girl from Clifford, uh, which is ironic <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in a lot of ways. But I was given the opportunity to basically cold pitch PBS um, back in 2018. And they were looking for humanities content and liked my idea of making monsters a way to approach really difficult conversations. And my informal slogan is monster history is human history. And luckily they responded well to that and the audience has as well. So it's just been spiraling um, from, I guess, my initial monstrous creation and growing into what it is today. <laughs> You actually couldn't have teed me up better for what I wanted to ask you next. Perfect. And that was really about um, uh, what, what do you think? Well, I mean, you must think this uh, if you if you consider this humanities research, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the underlying importance of monster tales that, that we all are familiar with? Does it tell us something about ourselves and our cultures? Mm -hmm. Is that is that an interesting way to think about monster tales? Absolutely. I think that monsters act as funhouse mirrors that reflect the world in an exaggerated way. I think that monsters serve as instructive metaphors that we alternatively use to teach moral lessons, condemn and promote certain behaviors or peoples, and act as also intellectual safe spaces for difficult conversations. I think that part of being human is creating monsters because they're so integrated excuse me, they're so intimately related to how we tell stories and how they both police, define, and challenge the boundaries of our culture. And kind of jumping off from that, you know, like mm -hmm. obviously with all the monsters you've covered, you know, in the series thus far and, and, and even beyond the series, would you say that, um, you know, the monster stories that we tell ourselves and, and continue to tell is, is there a kernel of truth that starts mm. most of those stories or, or, or like what's, what's your experience in that? Do you think that there's always something there that then leads to the stories that we know and love or, or how does that, uh, what's, what's your thought on that story? I do. I think that there's always some inherent truth in monster stories. I think that how you define truth is where it gets a little complicated. So for me, that truth might be in someone's real horrific experience or trauma that they experience at the hand of an individual. It might be because you saw a weird looking animal at night or you saw someone be attacked by a real life predator. Um, maybe you discovered fossilized bones that look like nothing you'd seen before. And so we, again, fill in the blanks with our imagination. So I do think that there's essentially maybe little dots or stars if you wanna think about it that way. And monsters help form the constellations that allow us to create these narrative myths. And in doing that, allow us to share stories more readily, because of course, it's easier to look at the sky and draw someone's attention to a singular image or object than it is to try to point out every single individual star. So if we wanna think about monster myths in that way, um, they help unite us. Yeah, and I think it's really the, the, what struck me about what you just said is that filling the gaps. It's like sort of pre-scientific mm -hmm. uh, thinking, where where if there's something that's so totally 
uh, unexpected that happens in the natural order, you know, a good way of, of describing that is, is through kind of those stopgap mythology measures, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And dinosaur fossils um, and just fossilized remains of any kind are a really easy way to point to how a tangible item in the real world can help contribute to myth making. I mean, there have been stories of things like woolly mammoth skulls that people thought resembled dragon heads or, you know, deep sea creatures that look like a different kind of dragon or a griffin or, um, you know, real life pits where multiple animal bones were fossilized together. And how do you explain a wing and also a tiger claw? You're going to make some kind of chimera to maybe explain that. But I do think we can't just look at the science elements and we can't just attribute all monster phenomenology to that. Again, it's just one point in the larger constellation. Um, I do think that we've seen monsters change over time since we have become more well-versed in science and technology. But I think really interestingly in digital folklore is a place where this is happening quite readily. There's almost a return to what I like to call uneasy nostalgia where we're making newer monsters that speak to how scared we are, <laughs> perhaps at the uncertainty of our world and maybe longing for when monsters could be a little more ambiguous, shall I say. I just thought of like 60 things more that I wanted to ask you. And I think <laughs> our listeners are gonna want us to ask you to get specific on some monsters. Um, but but one thing, there's a couple of things I wanna say first. I wanna go back to ASU for a second if I mm -hmm. could. And um, ASU seems to be pretty well known for its, uh, um, and I don't know enough about ASU to, to know if this is on purpose, but about science communication and about mm -hmm. uh, research communication. I'm a fan of uh, what Lawrence Krauss is doing with the Origins uh, series that, that mm -hmm. he had done in the past. Uh, is, is that on purpose? I mean, ASU seems to be really, uh, really, you know, public facing with a lot of its research communication. It is. Is ASU is forward thinking in how it is trying to approach learning and education and how it positions its faculty members. Uh, that being said, I do occupy a very niche <laughs> section of that. So it's not like it's a perfect environment. And again, this is not necessarily endemic to ASU, but first of all, I'm a humanities scholar. So I automatically get less funding and frankly, less respect in a lot of ways. And there are some people, including at ASU and our great humanities dean, uh, Dr. Cohen, who is working actively to try to fight that stigma, but I also do literature <laughs> and I also do monsters. So I'm sort of the weird one um, on the <laughs> faculty in a lot of ways, which I embrace. And I'm again, happy to be with ASU and to continue to teach at that level, but it, there's definitely pushback. And again, not just at ASU, I think from a lot more traditional scholars who see all public humanities work as maybe being taboo or not as quote unquote valid or rigorous. Where frankly, the kind of research that I'm doing for my Monstrum scripts, because I do research and write every single one, is the exact same kind of archival, historical, critical reading that I would be doing for an academic monograph. I mean, there's no difference to me. I use the exact same skills. And I just hope that my work uh, maybe gives new scholars or an upcoming scholar is a way to think about how our skills can be used outside of the university. I was going to ask you a question uh, about if you could comment on the increased popularity lately of these cryptozoology shows. Um, maybe if you want to just pause there and then I want to ask you a, a more specific question about what, what kind of monsters you like. But yeah. um, why do you think it is that like Discovery and other shows have like these pardon the term, like bullshit shows where like they're going to look for like the skunk ape and the, mm -hmm. you know, is there a reason why that's in, in vogue again now? I do think so. And I think that it's never, I'm, I apologize for my bird. I'm sorry. If I think it's great. Back, yeah. yeah. She's on one right now. So sorry. <laughs> um, but bird aside, I'm also a crazy yeah. bird lady. That's part of the other <laughs> facet of my personality. Yeah. Um, I think that the return to this desire in cryptozoology, like you said, in particular, because for me, the distinction between folklore studies, maybe, and cryptozoology or monster studies is that people 
believe them to be real and want them to be real. Whereas if you're thinking about the Nordic Dragor on Dead Figure, no one really thinks that there's, you know, corpses shambling around, but we want to believe that there's a giant ground sloth in the Amazon or some kind of crazy primate we have yet to discover that could be Yeti or Bigfoot. And I think it's that discovery element, um, ironically, <laughs> that makes us <laughs> really appreciate those sort of Bigfoot hunt or ancient aliens type stories. I think that again, as our world becomes increasingly more knowledgeable as a whole, and we are essentially collecting more and more data from all aspects of our environment, that we want mystery. We want there to still be something to discover. And I think we see this in a desire to go to other planets as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's practical reasons for that. And there's sort of fantastical imaginary reasons for that. I think that humans like to classify things and add categories and labels to things. So I think that you want to be the first one to discover Bigfoot, right? I mean, that's part of the appeal. So I think that it really speaks to this inherent nature that humans have of looking for new answers because new questions um, evolve from seeking out those answers. Yeah, I find uh, I watch those shows, even though I, you know, I, was I gonna know say, they're, I'm they're sure you watch them, Steve. Yeah, yeah no, I definitely do. <laughs> Um, so uh, you're ASU's uh, official monster expert. Which of the monsters out there uh, in history are you most drawn to? You mentioned the Egypt yeah. early on, but is there any, if we could force you to be specific, and I think <laughs> some of our subse subsequent questions will also get there too. Perfect. I mean, my favorite category of monster is the undead. Overall, I love a good reanimated corpse of any kind. <laughs> if it's vampiric and blood sucking, if it's viscera eating, if it's just, you know, coming out of its tomb to create a little bit of chaos and stomp on your roof, what have you, I think that the idea of the reanimated corpse is fascinating and quite frankly, universal. Um, in my research, every culture that buries their dead also has some kind of reanimated corpse monster myth associated with it. And again, I think that speaks to a fear of death, but also a fear of what happens after death. And what I find really intriguing about the undead of all kinds is that we're literally a heartbeat away from becoming them. And again, this changes, of course, with different zombie and vampire traditions and what have you, but I think there's something really interesting about how we as a human species have created this nearly universal figure. I'm a huge Walking Dead fan and yeah. uh, all zombie movies. Uh, before Walking Dead, my, my friends and I used to have like zombie fest at our house where Love. we'd often watch zombie films. So, you know, going back to like the sort of e the classical zombie, the Egypt sort of zombie Walking Dead type mm. folks all the way now to like the uh, 28 Days Later fast running zombies. So I'm, I'm definitely with you there. Yeah. And actually Monstrum has an episode, I'll tease this a little bit, uh, coming up about the idea of the reanimated mummy, because that's actually not something that the Egyptians believed in. Um, quite the opposite, in fact. They would actually do things to stop the physical corpse from rising. It was all about life after death for the soul. Uh, so stay tuned to learn more about that. But I'm with you with zombies. And again, I think part of my attraction to the undead is those were some of my four first horror movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of the first movies I remember watching were Night of the Living Dead, Salem's Lot, The yeah. Lost Boys. So I think that it's sort of this like mythical giant in my own personal monster history would be vampires and zombies. I think Pet Cemetery was the first movie that I watched as a kid that was like a problem for me at night. Yeah. Um, I think I remember <laughs> my parents being like, this was a mistake to have let you watch that. Um, so I love that though. Yeah. And yeah, my mom, cause I say in interviews all the time, I'm like, my mom introduced me to horror and she's like, stop telling people that. And I'm like, why should I? I mean, it made me who I am. I love it. But Salem's Lot, when the little boy is clawing on the window, <laughs> that has that still freaks me out to this day. Um, I just again, I think it's the undead too because it's not a dragon, it's not a troll, it's not something you haven't seen before. It's almost always a community member mm -hmm. or someone that you recognized in life. So to take them out of, I guess, the context you know them in is inherently scary, even for a kid. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I might think even the idea that like in, in that movie, like your own child, you know, after s suffering that a tragedy, then coming back and terrorizing, 
you know, your family and, and everyone, you know, I think, you know, as a, as a young, as a young boy, that was probably too much for my brain to process. I probably won't introduce that to my daughter <laughs> just yet. Maybe when she's a little bit older, but a little uh, bit older. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Stephen King's a genius for a reason. I think mm-hmm. he picked up on the fear we have of kids not acting the way they're quote unquote supposed to. Then you have the undead fear and yeah, the trauma of losing a child right in front of you in such a horrific way. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, those are the best horror stories and the best monsters for me. It's never just about one thing um or one star right we have to be collecting from all different aspects and fears of our society to make something really robust mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm gonna ask you to put your cryptozoologist hat back on right. for a second and so of all the monsters you've profiled over the you know the past four seasons or so which one would you think is the most uh, likely to be to exist mm. or the most has the biggest probability of, of being an actual thing out out in the wild somewhere So my first like caveat to that is for me, it's not necessarily about if the monster is real or not. It's what, why we want it to be real. Um, That being said, I would probably give a top two, although I wouldn't consider one a cryptid per se. So cryptid wise, I would say the Mapunguari um, from Brazil, which is essentially, uh, it looks very much like a prehistoric ground sloth. Uh, but with its mouth usually in the center of its stomach that's said to still roam around the Amazon by some of the indigenous peoples there. And I think that although fossil evidence wise, we haven't necessarily found anything. I think the Amazon is so vast and we know so little about it still Mm -hmm. that to me, it's not super improbable that there's some kind of larger biological or cultural memory of the people in that area that encountered at the very least some kind of remains of this ancient creature at one point. But again, I'm also not a paleontologist, so I don't know (laughs) exactly how reliable that would be, but not a cryptid, but probably one of the monsters that scares me the most because I do think they're quote unquote real is the Kraken. And I say that because giant squid are so scary. So scary. So scary. And when I was researching the Kraken episode and just learning about the giant squid that we have seen that a lot of scientists actually believe are like the small weak versions of like what might actually exist for that species. I totally believe there are giant squid creeping around near the bottom of our ocean. And that terrifies me. I've always, I I agree. I mean, I've always like, it's not only the black deep water that has that sort of unknown feature, but I mean, just not knowing when you see a kraken attacking a ship, you never see the whole thing. Even I mean, mm-hmm. it, there's so it's almost limitless power and destruction in this in this beast coming from the bottom mm-hmm. of the ocean, and and the fact that they found you know dead ones on the beach or wherever where they're already so big I, that that to me has always been terrifying. The, yes, the fun, agreed. F- funny thing I would say too is that uh, every night my daughter and I usually watch an animal video, and it's usually you know from the PBS channel on YouTube and. <laughs> There was one night where we were watching something about giant squid and it was the first time where she's like, I don't want to watch the rest of this because <laughs> she was, she was a little freaked out and she'd asked me, do we have, you know, squid in Sudbury? And I said, no, no, there's, there's nothing like that here, but I could tell that she was uncomfortable, uh, you know, by that particular animal. Cause it's just close enough to reality again. Yeah. I mean, it, not that these giant squid are attacking ships and like present day or pr- maybe it didn't even happen in the past, but the fact that they, I think a lot of the fear of ocean type monsters comes from how inherently scary deep water is. Mm -hmm. And again, Steve, like you were saying, it's not just the vastness and the darkness and the inability to see underneath the surface really clearly. It's that the stuff that we do have from the ocean looks so alien. Mm -hmm. It's so other and so bizarre. And yeah, squids and octopi are so crazy and they like have beaks but also they don't and like all the tentacles and the suckers Suction and there's cups, some uh... yes and some giant squids like some giant squid species literally have like hooks barbs on their suckers which is also crazy and i think just nature is wild and mm. <laughs> giant squid fit into maybe some of its more bizarre elements for me so yeah of course we're gonna make that into a monster that makes total sense yeah Steve- yeah Steve's going to roll his eyes right now, Emily, but you, you said you liked a good tangent. So I was just wondering if if you were aware that the Kraken will be coming to ASU this year because the Arizona coyotes are playing on campus. So there'll probably be at least one or two games where the Kraken will be there. I got so many tweets when I was at Washington changed their name 
um, or wherever, whatever hockey team it is to the Seattle, Kraken. Seattle, yeah, Seattle. Seattle. Yeah, I was, which, I mean, not a bad choice. Powerful sea monster. I get it. I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> you endorse it, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I endorse the Kraken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that wasn't too much of a tangent, Mike. Mike's a <laughs> hockey writer uh, and uh, in oh, his spare okay. time and uh, actually a, a hockey researcher too. He's he's a hockey historian, right, Mike? I, I try. I try. Yeah. Hockey is uh, one of my favorite sports to actually watch. I mean, I did grow up in Vermont, um, so oh. that's probably part of it, but I think it's interesting. But speaking of, I'll hear, I'm going to go on a tangent. Yeah, do it. Speaking of sports team monsters, I grew up again in Vermont with um, Champ who is sort of the New England version of the Loch Ness Monster, and who's supposed to occupy Lake Champlain. And there was a minor league baseball team. And there was like, the mascot was like this cryptid uh, <laughs> named Champ. And I always thought that was super cool. That's awesome. My dad was actually born in Vermont. And uh, we, uh, you, can, you can access Lake Champlain from uh, upstate New York too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing like what is this champ thing? I saw a plaque with like a like a uh, like the Loch Ness monster on it. I I didn't have time to read it, but that's what that was. Like they think there's a like a Loch Ness type monster in Lake Champlain. Yes, and again, oh, wow. I think and I have haven't researched it very extensively as an adult, but I remember being on like tours in the science center, like right on the water, and they had a section that I think, and I could be totally wrong, and I apologize to whatever curator came up with this, but what I remember is that some people were saying it's possible that beluga whales actually got in through like a little channel opening to the lake. And then people saw this very unfamiliar shape undulating mm -hmm. in the water and was like, oh my gosh, it's a monster. <laughs> but of course that brings up questions um, or I guess ideas about immigration too. It's like, was the first person who came up with the champ story, do they have ancestry in Scotland or familiarity with the um, like sea serpent type dragon? I don't know. Mm -hmm but I'd like to find out. So maybe that'll have to be one of my future on location shoots. <laughs> yeah. Get some good maple syrup while you're there. Yes. Um, Better than Canada's. I remember that battle whoa, as a kid too. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's tap the brakes. My dad may have been born in Vermont, but uh, most of my family's still in Quebec here. Let's, let's, let's tap the brakes on that. We'll agree to disagree for All a right. moment on, on that. Um, so this episode will come out uh, probably just before Halloween, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things you know, we understand that your sort of scariest monster is the, uh, is the giant squid. Uh, I don't think too many people would be wearing that for you. What do you think would the scariest sort of monster costume for Halloween be that you'd be running from? A Halloween costume. Oh, easy. Black eyed children. Um, I have an inherent fear of trick or treaters. <laughs> which is very ironic given my career and also makes me seem like a huge curmudgeon but I have since I can honestly remember been terrified of children trick-or-treaters <laughs> and my rationale for this is that there's no other time that I'm aware of where you just open your door to masked strangers and I think that I've read too many horror stories and too much folklore that my brain just goes in a million different directions. So for Halloween, I was and still am the person who like might be looking through the window because I want to maybe see the costumes, but I'm certainly not the one to answer the doorbell. So the urban legend of black eyed children, um, you know, wearing the hoodies and with completely black uh, irises and pupils, I think that would be a costume that would be very effective for me. That was a very thoughtful answer. I, I mean, it wasn't uh, it wasn't like a, a zombie or something like that. Black eyed children. I'd actually never thought of trick or treaters in that way, but you're quite right. We just open our doors yeah. uh, to to strangers uh, on for one night a year, and and then that's supposed to be okay. It is terrifying. Now I might have to rethink this. And I can't remember the name of the movie, but um, the famous strangers American version is actually based on a French version that where the people who are terrorizing the family randomly are actually children. That's based um, on a true story. Yeah. So that... uh, that's the, that's the scariest movie I've ever seen. I want you to know that, that, that is my, <laughs> it haunted. I was an adult when I watched it. And to this day, if we're renting a cottage somewhere or we're we, that, that to me is the scariest thing because, and I'll tell you why I'll just, this is my tangent now. <laughs> I love it. it. This is what encapsulates it for me. They were asked, why did you do this to us? Yeah. And they said, because you were home. 
Like, so think about Halloween. Everyone's yeah, home giving exactly. out candy. Ugh, yeah. No, trick My or treaters gosh. are a hard pass for me. I'm so glad you brought up uh, the strangers because that is a terrifying movie. Mm -hmm. Terrifying. Anyway. This is making me think now that when we were younger, my mom had a rule on Halloween that like there was, we couldn't wear masks. We could have makeup, but she wouldn't let us wear masks. And masks. maybe it's because of that. But I also think maybe she thought from a safety perspective, if you had a mask on, you may not be able to see as well. But yes. I, I remember the first mask <laughs> I was ever able to get was like the mask um, from R.L. Stein's The Haunted Mask book after the Ooh. series was adapted. Yeah. And that was the first time. I think it was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11, but uh, all those years before that, no masks. So your mom's smart. See, I'd be curious to know her rationale, but safety and and for many people, for the people answering mm -hmm. the door and for you. <laughs> well, she definitely listens to this podcast, so I'm sure we will hear uh, hear why she she had that <laughs> rationale once this airs. But uh, love it. I, I did want to ask you a question, just because it's it's rare that I would get to bring this up. But uh, mm -hmm. there's an obscure there was an obscure Canadian punk band from Calgary, Alberta called Chicks Dig It, um, okay. and they had a song called Chupacabra. Have you ever heard that song? I feel like it, I did hear about it when I was researching the Chupacabras episode. Okay. Um, but there's been a lot of songs about Chupacabras, which is really interesting. So what is it about that one that stood out to you? Honestly, it was probably when I was like in my formative years where I was discovering punk music and I'd never yeah. heard of a Chupacabra before. And then the lyrics obviously tie back into it. Don't watch the music video because it has nothing to do with the <laughs> lyrics. It's, I think yeah. it was in that era of music videos that are just kind of, you know, produce Random. and have nothing to do with the song. They were on a plane and uh, the band, I think were acting as flight attendants, but nevertheless, if you <laughs> haven't heard it lately, check it out. I think it's on YouTube. Uh, but uh, let me know what you think about, about that song. But that I mean, brings up another tangent, right? Is the overlap of monsters and folklore and certain kinds of music, you know, like punk metal folk mm -hmm. music too. But it's again, sort of the margins of society, I think, are where monsters really thrive. And I think that applies to other kinds of art as well. Mm -hmm. And Emily, you've been so generous with your time, but before, you know, we let you go, we've just, we spent, you know, roughly the last half hour, you know, talking about monsters and, and zombies and things like that. Do you ever pinch yourself and say like, I can't believe I get to do this for a living and, and talk about this? Or does that ever come up for you? Honestly, all the time. <laughs> um, if you had told me 10 years ago or even five years ago that this would be the journey that I get to be on right now, I would frankly not believe you. <laughs> I just, again, get to absorb myself in what I truly love to do the most, which is research and write. And not only that, research and write about horror and monsters and folklore. And it is a surreal journey in so many ways. So yes, it does feel like a dream, not a nightmare, but either <laughs> way, I'm very grateful. Well, I think, uh, gosh, I have so many more questions, but I think we'll, <laughs> we'll leave. Maybe you'll be our first return guest ever, but, I would um, love that. <laughs> but, um, uh, Emily Zarka, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Mike and I on the unlikely innovators today. And, uh, we think this is, this was a, a great discussion and we just really thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I'd love to be back. Well, that was a great chat, Steve. I know that we could have, uh, I think you would have liked to keep her on a little bit longer for all the monster zombie <laughs> questions that I'm sure you had, but I think to your point, you know, we haven't had, a recurring guest yet but i think uh i think there's a lot more ground to cover because again i i we held back uh, i think i could have gone on further with the crack and i didn't share that when i was younger there was a movie a, i think it was a made for tv movie about this crew that was attacked by a giant squid and i was i was terrified of that because of it you know sharks are one thing but like i don't know it, you just like you're not reasoning with a shark either but you're definitely not reasoning with like something that has a beak, but also claws within its tentacles, like in the suction cups, like there's all sorts of it's things too much. that I just can't, I can't reason with. So, yeah. um, but I, I did want to share that it's, it's funny because, you know, Emily talked about, you know, kind of her unlikely journey, although I think she was always drawn, you know, to the, to the world that she currently studies in. Um, but the, the way that I came across Emily was actually because, as I mentioned in the episode, like Zoe and I watch a, a brief, like animal, uh, video before before she goes to bed after we've read some books and we are usually watching something on bbc or pbs and after mm -hmm. one of our pbs videos it like suggested 
do you want to watch, you know, monster? And I'd never heard about it before. And I think we got a little bit into it. And I said, you know what, you're about to go to bed. Let's, <laughs> let's park this. I think we could definitely revisit this, but maybe not before I close the door and shut, shut off the lights. Maybe that's a lunchtime ritual to watch uh, yeah. monster. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just for your own sleep, Mike, just think about, uh, think about the children, but, yeah. um, but yeah, no, just super great time. Really cool insights. Uh, I think I never read until she mentioned it. I never thought about how much I thought like, like sea dwelling creatures were scary that those were never the monsters I was scared of. Um, I was always scared of like aliens and like alien abduction. And I'm sure there's a whole psychological reason why that particularly, uh, you know, didn't appeal to me in that way. Uh, but what monsters were you super scared of that you can think of when you were a kid? Well, I mean, I definitely watched Pet Cemetery too early. And then so I was afraid <laughs> of that. But then I was also what I didn't share with Emily was that like, as much as Pet Cemetery scared me, the one of the characters, the wife's sister had spinal meningitis and the way that they had portrayed it in the movie it was obviously not what spinal meningitis looks like. But that I was scared of getting that because of how the sister Zelda looked. So that was haunting. Um, so I, you know, she's not a monster. She was suffering from an illness. So I don't know if that's the monster I was worried about, but what I would say when I was, when I was younger, um, you know, I, it was, I think it was aliens as well though, because I think, you know, you and I are obviously the same age when X-Files came out, Oh, like, you know, you're like say, eight, eight years old. So then all when, of a sudden, like, sister you're got, now worried about yeah. the guy who like is able to like slide his way through vents and feasts on human livers and, and things like this, like that became, you know, part of my zeitgeist. And I definitely remember at night thinking, you know, any light that I saw outside the window that was irregular to me, that's a spaceship. There's aliens yeah, coming, yeah. right? But it was probably just a car driving by or a sirens from a fire truck or something. Who knows, right? But we should have asked her about the X Files. She seems to be around the same age as we are. I'm sure she I'm sure she was aware of X Files growing up. And you, too. you know, we didn't ask her about either, and I kind of alluded to it, but it was just like, did she read our, Did she read Goosebumps? Oh yeah. Because yeah. that's another one where I was admiring her book collection. She said she still had all her books from even middle school, and I, I kicked myself that I don't have that Goosebumps collection when I was a kid because yeah, yeah. I would love to be able to go back and kind of flip through those books because I, you know, spent they summers might, Mike, reading those. Like Mike, don't meet your heroes. They might not hold up. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It, yeah. Well, that's that was a. I had a story idea where what if you know if if some you know publication allowed me to do this, where I reread all of those Goosebumps books in a single summer, and then offered up my thoughts on what it was like reading those books now with the eyes of a 37 year old and not a bright eyed eight year old, right? And uh, did did you actually pitch that to anyone? I did, and they of course uh, <laughs> declined. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, there's a, there's a lot of self publishing avenues now. So that's true. I mean, if it is something I really want to do, there's a mechanism to do it. But yeah, I think, answering uh... the question that no one asked, Mike Camito. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was great to have Emily on, and uh, we'll wrap this up now. But uh, thanks to her, and I mean, just the X Files and R.L. Stein questions alone is enough to have her back. I would think so. But before we do uh, close off this episode, because you're going to be listening to this, dear listener, you know, right before Halloween. Um, Steve, what was your, as a kid, or even as an adult now, who's, you know, partaking in, in the in the Halloween candy, you know, that your nephew's bringing home? Um, yeah. What's your number one treat on Halloween? If you could? Yeah. Oh, man. You know, did you notice, let me ask you this back, I will answer your question, uh, as it was posed to me. But did you notice that there was a time when there wasn't individual small can like small chocolate bars. There was a time before that where there was a lot of like suckers, mm -hmm. the uh, the really rockets. annoying candy corn, <laughs> the rockets. Um, I, I'll give you a bit. This is a non typical, but when I was young, uh, my aunt ran a restaurant and corner store in Astaire, a very small place outside of Sudbury here in, in Ontario, and uh, she would often have handmade candy apples. Oh yeah. Uh the red ones, not the caramel ones. Yeah. And uh that would probably be the highlight. We'd always stop there, the last stop on the way back, and those were by far my favorite Halloween candies. What about yeah. you? Um honestly, like because I, I I think for me it was always just like the little Mars bars. Oh like yeah. that's like that's probably my top tier of candies. Um, you know, anybody who works in our office knows that I'm buying that particular box of assorted candies before Halloween. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, what's your thought on pop cans? You don't see those anymore now, but back in the well, day. <laughs> so as an adult, 
uh, sure, I'd like a can of pop or soda for the American fans. But having more than two of them in your bag as a child, you can't you can't even lift them. You're, you're no. If you're using a pillowcase, it's getting too heavy and sweaty. Yeah. If it's if it's a grocery bag, it's gonna fall apart by the end of the night. So wait, why no, is no. why is the why is the pillowcase getting sweaty though? Just from, from your, your hands. Your hands yeah, are grip. so sweaty like, from, the from the grip. Going into the. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you so. just gotta sling it over your shoulder. But no, I agree. I'm glad that we don't see pop cans. Or actually, I say that, but Zoe got a couple cans of pop. Uh, last year and we honestly i think just like drained them when we got home and threw them yeah, in the blue like, box <laughs> exactly I, I just who's drinking that anymore you know don't kids drink mineral water now uh well yeah no zoe has had pop on a special occasion but yeah certainly not it's definitely the game has changed since we were kids i'll tell you yeah. that how about the lamos that give you a toothbrush that's that's got to be is that an, like an urban legend i never actually got one um you know what i don't think i've got i don't think i ever had one either but as an adult i would actually appreciate that now yeah if i were trick-or-treating i know the dentist <laughs> says you know get like the soft toothbrush i find i don't get a good clean i need medium or hard i can't i can't do a soft bristle yeah. but that's just a that's just my neuroses anyway <laughs> maybe we've gone on too long but yes <laughs> uh trick-or-treat everyone have a happy <laughs> halloween yeah <laughs> all right take care everyone see ya the Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining.